pleasure, the immense pleasure and honor to present a brother who is a friend of people in struggle, an internationalist, um, someone who is not only a journalist, but he is also an organizer, an activist, and scholar. If you don't know him, you best to know him. And he is hashtag goals. And his name is BJ Prashad. <laughs> Good evening, friends. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you. Uh, how many of you were at the Riverside Church last evening? Yay. Yes, good number of you. That was an impressive gathering. In many ways, that was uh, an evening of solidarity. After all, the president of Cuba spoke directly about the question of solidarity. He spoke of Cuba's history of solidarity, its history of solidarity in sending out people for the missions on health, on literacy, but also, very importantly, solidarity with the national liberation movements of Africa. He spoke of Cuba's role in Namibia, Cuba's role in Angola, and then he used a very powerful phrase. He spoke of Cuba's role in demoralizing, that was the word he used, demoralizing the apartheid state in South Africa. Mm. Now, why this word demoralizing is so important is that Many of you may not know that the Cuban troops arrived in Angola and as part of the defense of the Angolan people against the racist armies of South Africa, the Cuban people fought alongside the Angolans in the town of Kunto Kodivale and scored an incredible victory against the South African military. You know, not often in world history do we have armies of the people defeat the armies of the imperialists. Yeah. It doesn't happen often. In the history of Asia, for instance, it has always been a mark of pride that the Japanese defeated the Russian Empire in 1905. But of course, the Japanese army was not the army of the people. Before that, in 1895-96, the Ethiopian forces defeated the armies of the Italians. But friends, let's be frank. The Ethiopian army was not the army of the people. The Ethiopian army was the army of an imperial regime. When the Cubans went to Africa and joined the Angolan forces of national liberation against the South Africans, that was an army of the people that defeated a highly motivated, trained, and equipped army, the army of apartheid South Africa. Now, the Cuban president, Diaz Canel, said yesterday that the defeat of the South Africans demoralized not only the South African army, because friends, the demoralization of the South African army wasn't the sole point of the story. What he was reminding us about, and I think this is very important for our times, was that the defeat at Kunto Kunivale of the South African forces demoralized the apartheid regime. This war took place in 1987. Apartheid collapsed in 1994. But it was only after Kunto Kunivale that the fascistic 
white apartheid regime of South Africa had to seriously open negotiations with the South African Liberation Forces led by the African National Congress and its allies including the South African Communist Party. The Cuban contribution on, in Africa is not a marginal contribution. It was a central contribution to the destruction of the apartheid regime. But I want to take us back just a little bit. Behind me is an interesting picture. It's Madiba, Nelson Mandela, whose statue now is in that little strange place of UN land. <laughs> There's of course Commandante Chavez in the middle, and I'll say something about Chavez in a minute. And then there's Martin Luther King Jr. On solidarity, when we think of the phrase solidarity, we think of the slogan, I stand with. I stand with South African people against the apartheid regime. I stand with the Cuban people against US imperialism, etc. I stand with. In that phrase, stand with, the two words are very important. The word stand and the word with. You can't stand by yourself. Mm. You can't stand up for something alone. You see, there is a tradition of bearing witness to atrocity where an individual could stand up and say, I bear witness against atrocity. But typically, when we think of the word stand, we're talking about the context of a political action. When we stand with, it's in a context that we are standing. We stand with other people. The with is important. With means that we're standing with somebody specific for a reason. We're not just standing for nothing. We're not just standing for an abstract idea. We're standing for something concrete. So it's not only the context that we have to consider when we think of solidarity, standing, we don't want to stand alone, but we have to also think about who we're standing with, which begs the question of why we're standing with someone. It's important when we think of the American civil rights struggle, to think about context. It didn't just happen at any time. This movement picked its steam up during the movement of decolonization in Africa, in Asia, and of course in parts of Latin America. It was the decolonization movement around the world that provides the context for the American civil rights movement. Right. In the United States, when they tell the story of the civil rights movement, they treat it as a peculiarly American story. Mm. A story about Americans trying to realize the destiny of American people in injustice in the 19th century, perhaps in the 18th century, which is redeemed by Americans through an American struggle. It's an unfortunate suffocating of the civil rights story, which was always part of an international moment. If we just take the story of King, you have to remember that King was interested in India. He was interested in what had happened in India. He, after all, traveled to India in the 1950s and in Ebony magazine wrote a very moving story called My Visit to the Land of Gandhi. When he was in India, King visited in the city of Bombay, the room where Gandhi used to stay. And in this room, which was now a museum, King wanted to spend the night. The people who controlled the museum said, nobody can stay here at night, it's not possible. You can visit and then you have to leave. King said, no, I would like to spend the night here. They said, there's no proper bed and you know, you're an American. 
And Americans can't sleep on the floor. And you might be a civil rights leader, but you are really an American. There's no proper toilet here, and you won't manage. You better go back to the five-star hotel. But King said, I want to be here. And he spent the night in this museum room in order to feel the spirit of Gandhi. But actually, I don't think he wanted just to feel the spirit of Gandhi. Because this is the 1950s. It's in this period, in the 1950s, that all these states are winning their independence. India, of course, was independent in 1947. But 10 years later, just when King is in India, Ghana wins its independence. You know, monumental episode in the history of national liberation on the African continent. Right. In 1959, Cuba has its revolution. Yeah. Yeah. And that Cuban revolution will look immediately to the United States and make its link to the civil rights struggle. Mm. And I don't merely mean that when Fidel Castro comes to the United Nations in 1960, I don't merely mean that when Castro comes here, the US government makes it impossible for him to find a hotel room. And so Malcolm X invites him to the Lennox Hotel in Harlem. I don't merely mean that. I mean that inside Cuba, there's an entire cultural project of solidarity with the American civil rights struggle. Mm -hmm. And it was through its solidarity materials that people around the world were able to experience the American civil rights struggle. I mean, it is important to recognize that it's not just that China's communist leadership allowed Robert Williams, the civil rights leader from North Carolina, the NAACP, not that they just allowed him to come and live in China, but the Chinese government made very specific and real contributions to the civil rights struggle by promoting events inside the United States around the world, and thereby, and thereby embarrassing the U.S. government, putting pressure on the U.S. government. If you go back and read State Department cables, which are publicly available, you'll see that every time something happened in, with Bull Corner in Birmingham and so on, it was on the front page of the Soviet newspaper Pravda. Mm. And the American State Department was very sensitive to the way in which the Soviets, the Chinese, the Cubans, and others in the non-aligned movement were able to utilize the brutality inside the United States to show what advanced capitalism really was. Right. Solidarity, solidarity, standing, was part of this context. In other words, the civil rights movement was able to take flight because it was another episode in the process of decolonization. Because after all, African Americans, Latinos inside the United States, Puerto Ricans, Asians, Native Americans, were colonized subjects. And they were struggling for decolonization. Stand and then with. Who are you standing with? You are standing with the fighters for justice inside the United States. There was a concrete element of solidarity. That is why fighters for justice within the United States have always been invited when they go into exile into these countries. Right. Asana Shakur, for instance, yeah. isn't living in London. 
They've always been given refuge. Right. Because solidarity is not just an abstract idea. You are in solidarity with somebody. You're in solidarity with the movement. Right. To go back to South Africa, you see, stand and with. The context for both South Africa and Palestine was terrible. South Africa and Palestine were two of the few places that were unable to win even formal decolonization during the era of decolonization. The era of decolonization runs from the 1940s to the 1980s. Both South Africa and Palestine were not allowed to become free, even formally free, during the era of decolonization. Their constrained freedom came in the 1990s. In South Africa, when apartheid formally ended in 1994, and for the Palestinian people, when the Oslo Accords were signed around that same time, 93 and 94. In both cases, and I want us to think about this seriously, in both cases, the national liberation struggles had to surrender. I put it to you that in Palestine and in South Africa, the national liberation forces surrendered to the international capitalist order. So solidarity with Palestine and with South Africa was very strong from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and continues today. The residue of that solidarity is with us still. But the, the national liberation forces in both contexts had to surrender. See, we don't think of that term when we think of what happened to those two national liberation movements. But I want you to focus on it for a second. Palestine, the surrender is clearer. In Palestine, the surrender was in such a situation that the Palestinian leadership, after the first intifada that broke out in 1987, the same year that the Cuban troops helped the Angolans defeat the South African apartheid forces in Punto Konivale, in 1987, the first intifada breaks out. But by 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the major rock for international struggles disappeared. And the United States became the sole superpower. Now, you know, friends, it's a curious thing. We don't like to talk about the Soviet Union in anything but trying to sort of skip it out of our story. We don't want to get into it. People are embarrassed to talk about the Soviet Union. But if you're embarrassed to talk about the Soviet Union, you don't understand how the era of decolonization was able to take place. It was the existence of the Soviet Union that enabled the era of decolonization to become a real thing. The surrender in Palestine took place in the context where the United States was the sole superpower and basically forced the Palestinian leadership, itself exhausted in its struggles, to come to Oslo and then to Ohio and sign the surrender document, which was the Oslo Accord. At the same time, the South African National Liberation Forces entered into a dialogue with the apartheid regime. Nelson Mandela was brought out of Robben Island. And they signed a surrender document, a mediated settlement in which the South new South African government was not going to touch the monopoly capital wealth of the white apartheid elite. That was a surrender in 1994. The context of South Africa should never be forgotten, which is why if we are disappointed today by things we see in South Africa, 
It's not because the National Liberation Movement was not itself a coherent force to struggle to transform the world. It's not because of that. It's because of the surrender that the National Liberation Movement accepted in 1994 and didn't touch white monopoly capitalism in South Africa. Which is why, for instance, the issue of land in South Africa is back on the table. It is why such a small number of white monopoly capitalists control most of the wealth in South Africa. The context changes yet again in the third phase. As I said, we'll come to Chavez in a minute. I'm coming to Chavez now. <laughs> Comrade, since you have arrived now, I'm going to talk about Chavez. It's a curious moment for me to talk about Chavez just as you arrive. That means the Commandante is giving messages somehow in the universe. The context changes in this third phase. You know, when the Soviet Union collapses, the United States is the sole superpower, pushes its own agenda through multilateral organizations, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and of course the United Nations, which an American ambassador, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in his memoir called A Dangerous Place. In the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the IMF pushed a very harsh agenda against the third world as a consequence of the third world debt crisis. And it's in this period, this harsh agenda against the peoples of the planet, that a series of very important uprisings begin. They were known as IMF riots. And we know the most famous of those IMF riots took place in Venezuela in 1992, the Caracas. Now let's not, let's not minimize the importance of this uprising. Because this actually starts the context of the third period. It's the period when people pushed back against unipolar imperialism thrust upon the world by the United States, which had come to imagine itself as having eternal power over the planet. And it's because people said no. It's because people said no that movements took seriously the possibility that an alternative was possible. You know, at the World Social Forum, the slogan was so empty, it was another world is possible. Such an empty slogan. Another world is possible. What does it even mean, another world is possible? But what those people said when they rose up in places like Caracas, they said, they didn't say another world is possible, they said, socialism is necessary. Wow. Another world is possible. Another world is possible is a slogan without a content. It has no content. It doesn't say anything. Yes, another world is possible. Fascism is possible. It doesn't say anything. Trump is possible. Trumpism is possible, even worse. But what the people were saying is socialism is necessary. Yes. And it's that that produces Chavez. Yes. See, Chavez is the embodiment of that struggle. See, we don't in our movement believe that people are like gods. We don't believe that. We believe that people make history. But people also make their leaders. People conjure up their leaders from amongst themselves 
And the leader then is the mirror of popular aspirations. That is what we need to understand to put flesh to the bone of Chavez. But of course, immediately the attack comes. The attempted coup in 2002 against the government of Chavez. And then Chavez does something unforgivable. You see, it's one thing to try and make socialism in one country. But Chavez tries to take the region with him. He has with him his comrade Evo Morales. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, yesterday, yesterday, Evo Morales, in the Security Council, sitting one seat away from Trump, one seat away from Trump, read Trump the Riot Act. Yesterday, Evo Morales told Trump about US imperialism. In case Trump doesn't know that history. Because he doesn't. You see, Trump is now worrying about Chinese interference in the American election. <laughs> Evo Morales said, you interfered in Iran. You interfered in Guatemala. And then they tried the coup in 2002 in Venezuela. And in Honduras. And in Honduras in 2009. Quite right. And everywhere else. I mean, you can start reciting the names of 192 countries. Friends, we used to joke, and I'm going to end very soon. We used to joke, friends. We used to ask the question, why isn't there a coup d'etat in the United States? The answer was, because in the United States, there's no U.S. Embassy. The attack on Venezuela was harsh and remains harsh. And the attack is harsh, friends, because it is threatening to imperialism to put on the table the concrete possibility of socialism. It is threatening to put on the table the concrete possibility that the Latin American hemisphere will exit from imperialism. It is threatening. It is threatening that the idea of socialism will then catch on among people who have previously been involved in IMF riots, who continue to be involved in IMF riots, and are fed up with the possibility that this is going to continue forever. Because, friends, because what capitalism gives us is life without a future. Capitalism tells you the misery you have today is going to last forever. <laughs> Capitalism doesn't have the future tense. It has the past tense and the present tense. Human beings don't want to live in the present tense. Human beings want to live in the future tense. And the future tense, friends, is socialism. Yeah. See you in the future.